welcome to this morning's session on living on the edge service, uh, bundling microservices to optimize consumption for devices with Spring Cloud and Netflix OSS. Now there are times over, are there any questions and answers? <laughs> uh, anyway, my name is Mark Heckler. I am a principal technologist and developer advocate with Pivotal Software Inc. Pivotal is a tiny little startup in Silicon Valley, uh, makers of Spring Boot, Spring Framework, Redis, Greenplum, RabbitMQ, Cloud Foundry, huge contributor to Apache Tomcat, and a giant handful of other things. You may have heard of it. Um, I blog semi-regularly at theHecklers.org, my personal domain. I tweet very regularly at MKHeck uh, on Twitter. Anyone here on the Twitters? Couple, okay. It's kind of sad. You can do better. Come on. Um, if, uh, if you're not on the Twitters, which I highly encourage you to be because the signal to noise ratio is really good there. There's a lot of good information. There's not a lot of cruft as compared to many other social networks. But if you're not on there, you can always contact me via the old fashioned social network called email uh, at markthehecklers.org. Everyone here on email? Okay, that's a little more encouraging. All right. Anyway, so who am I? I ask myself that daily. Uh, I'm the author of several blogs and blog posts, uh, co-author of one book already and another pending. I contribute, have contributed to several others. I love to read, I love to write, I love to share. Uh, I've spoken around the world on various development-centered topics and thank you for inviting me here, by the way. Love Code Motion uh, and love this venue. This is really, really cool. Uh, first and foremost, though, I'm a developer. I've worked for various consultancies and then for Oracle for several years. Uh, now, of course, I hang my virtual hat at Pivotal. Uh, I use what works, just like you, and I do my best to fill any gaps that I find. I love open source. I think it's the model of the present and the future. It uh, doesn't mean there aren't exceptions, but those really are exceptions. I think that's where we're headed. Uh, I've survived years of working on monoliths and have struggled with the same issues that you probably have, large, lumbering, brittle systems that infrequently update their production deploys. Inflexible systems with inflexible configurations. And finally, I'm always looking for a better way uh, to deploy real software to production, software with real business value, not undifferentiated heavy lifting as Adrian Cocroft, uh, formerly of Netflix, often says. So, listening to me try to speak Dutch is very similar to listening to a Vogon recite poetry. Does anyone get that reference? Oh, thank goodness, okay. <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If you haven't read it, read it. Uh, if, you haven't, if you can't bother to read it, watch it, but uh, good stuff. Uh, Vogon's reciting poetry is, uh, are, are known, or is known as one of the worst things in the world. Uh, well, worst things anywhere, <laughs> actually. So I will be presenting in English so everyone should be able to actually understand me um, so, who here is a Java developer? I'm going to save time to say who isn't, right? Anyone use Spring in any of its various incarnations? Okay, excellent. Uh, anyone here familiar with 12-factor apps? Yeah, that's good. Cloud native, concept of cloud native applications? Okay, this is good. Um, I guess just as a, a really quick overview for those who aren't as familiar, uh, something you hear a lot is that the Spring Framework is just extremely capable, does a lot of things, uh, well, does everything practically, but it's big, it's huge, it's cumbersome, all the, the normal complaints you hear against comprehensive frameworks. Uh, Spring Boot is often referred to as a micro framework. I don't know that that's necessarily that accurate, but I guess the concept kind of works. Uh, as it says here, from zero to app in under five minutes, what it does is take the, the goodness of the Spring Framework, all the capabilities and kind of bundle them into a way to create a fully self-contained deployable jar so you can do microservices, Java and microservices. Um, it version synchronizes all your various different libraries and dependencies, so it, it takes a lot of the stress and frustration out of being a developer. Uh, and it allows you to deploy it literally anywhere, uh, any place that can run, uh, run a JVM. So you can run it on a desktop or a server or, or any kind of cloud environment as well. I keep bumping that, I'm gonna knock that off. And then Spring Cloud. Uh, Spring Cloud is designed uh, for Spring engineers, Pivotal engineers, along with Netflix engineers, for fragile infrastructure. And what do I mean by fragile infrastructure? Well, when you have a monolith, and I'm gonna uh, speak kind of generally here, 
typically when you have a monolithic application, it's either up or it's down. And it kind of goes as a package. So if it's up, it's up. Everything kind of works for the most part. Uh, with a microservice uh, architecture, I, I always kind of use Netflix as an example for a lot of uh, good reasons, but uh, anyone here a Netflix subscriber? Okay. You know their web page when you go to that? You pull it up in your browser, netflix.com, and you see all the different things on there. That has about 500 plus microservices that feed that one single page. What are the odds at any given point in time that one of those may be down? Pretty good. So you have to assume it's a fragile, uh, fragile infrastructure. And by designing and building for a fragile infrastructure, you, you approach things a little bit differently. You don't spend all your time trying to figure out how to keep everything running. You look at ways to make it reliable, but quickly, um, quickly recoverable. You want very uh, small, uh, singularly focused modules that can quickly be brought back online, that can quickly expand and scale. So that's what I mean by uh, fragile infrastructure. And we kind of uh, will get into that here shortly. Netflix OSS, Spring Cloud OSS, there's a lot of overlap there. Uh, not 100% overlap, and I kind of point out the uh, distinctions here. But there are a few key things that you need for uh, a, a cloud-based environment where you can run microservices as well and reliably. Uh, 12 factor apps, I'm gonna go back to that just a little bit. There are a few, well, about 12 uh, key concepts that, that go along with a pure 12 factor application. Uh, one is to externalize your configuration. You shouldn't have configuration baked into your code so that when you deploy to a different environment or change out your database that you have to do a new build. Uh, this just shouldn't happen because your code doesn't change, your functionality doesn't change, just the configuration does, so you need to isolate that out. Uh, another one of the 12 factors is to uh, bring in all of your dependencies and bundle them with it, uh, with your application, so that you don't rely upon external linkages that may break uh, for, for dependencies. So going back to the first one, where you externalize your configuration, that can get to be a little bit cumbersome when you're dealing with, let's say, those 500 microservices, and maybe you have multiple instances of each of those microservices. So if you're trying to externalize your configuration for thousands of microservices, or instances of, that gets to be pretty difficult to handle. Uh, the Spring Cloud config service allows you to externalize that without introducing an external bottleneck, because you don't want to go away from a monolith just to create, if you will, a monolith, or what functions as one. With configuration properties, which are typically things like URLs, uh, you'll have a text-based property. And with text-based properties, you want to be able to edit them, uh, change them, version control them, audit them, all the things that we use Git for on a daily basis as developers. So we use Git for our interface for the config server. Uh, what it does, in effect, is take a Git repo and serve that up to the various microservices that contact it and request configuration properties. Uh, next on the list, you need something for service registry and discovery. Netflix created Eureka, uh, Spring Cloud OSS abstracted from that, so you don't have to use Eureka, you can use uh, HashiCorp Console, Zookeeper, uh, Cloud Foundry, but I show Eureka because it is a Netflix uh, product, it works really well, demos very nicely, uh, so you'll see a little bit of that today. Netflix also has things like Hystrix for a circuit breaker, and just like a circuit breaker in your house, if there's a problem with the wiring in one room, you don't want your house to burn down. You always also don't want your room to be burnt to a crisp. You'd rather just have the breaker drop out, and then you can restore functionality when you get the problem resolved. That's exactly what a circuit breaker does in software as well. Ribbon uh, gives you a client-side load balancer, so when you have microservices hitting other microservices, you don't necessarily want or need to have a server-side load balancer in the middle of things. That's especially important when you talk about multi -availabil uh, multiple availability regions. You want to be able to have the clients have that information uh, so that it can, each client can stay within its region wherever possible. You also uh, don't want to introduce, again, the bottlenecks or the problems if you have communi uh, communication drop out from under you. So you need that type of thing, typically on client-based load balancer. Uh, Zool provides intelligent routing. That gives you the ability to do things like microproxies, API gateways, which I talk about here in a little bit. And then, of course, you have um, 
Spring Cloud Security and OAuth 2, providing your capabilities, your security capabilities, so we can secure things. So, those are all my slides. Uh, that's pretty much it. So now let's uh, let's roll into the fun stuff, and uh, hopefully the demo gods will be kind today. And let me change my screen back to mirror displays. And yes, okay, we're good. So to give you kind of the quick start, and that. Let's see. That's a little better. Okay. To start off with, everything that I'm going to be developing here today is based around Spring Boot. Again, that provides us a nice, consistent, bundled package that we can deploy pretty much anywhere. It's clean, it's neat, it's fast. To start with a Spring Boot project, you can do it all manually. However, there's uh, st the Spring Initializer, start.spring.io. Memorize that because it's really handy to have. You can also hit it with curl. There's a command line interface, but it's so nice to be able just to pull it up and look at it. It's pretty. Uh, <laughs> so it gives you a lot of options. You can uh, use Maven or Gradle. You can choose your Spring Boot version. Uh, if you switch to the full version, you can get a little better idea of all the various options that are at your disposal. You can choose packaging for JAR or WAR. Uh, I always recommend JAR because that allows you, to, again, to do the 12-factor thing where you bundle your dependencies in there. You're not depending on an external uh, application server, which may have configuration issues that you don't anticipate uh, from environment to environment. You can choose your Java version. You can even choose to use something other than Java, like Kotlin or Groovy. Um, you can flip down through here and kind of see all the various different libraries. And again, these are all version synchronized. So when you select something to build into your application, you don't have to worry about the version that you need. You don't have to spend hours or days trying to figure out why the five dependencies that you included don't work together, only to find out you have to roll back one library, one version. So it's all synchronized and tested and synchronized for you. Uh, you can also simplify this a lot, again, just by going back to the, there it is, simple version. And then if you provide your dependencies, you start typing, it will offer you options, which is actually, I think, a much cleaner interface. So let's start off with kind of the essentials first. Uh, let's start with a config service. And for the config service, all we need to make sure we provide is the dependency for a config server. So what is happening now is that it doesn't generate your code for you. It generates a shell project. It pulls in, for instance, your POM and your dependencies and some basic code structure. So it'll zip that up nicely, let us download it. You download, you unzip, open it up in your favorite editor, which is quite tiny apparently, so let's fix that. Okay, let's, let's embiggen this here and see what that gets us. Oh yeah, that's actually much nicer. Okay. For our config service, what we need to do is provide a couple things. We're going to tell it what port to run on. I'm going to run everything locally for the demo, uh, but again, this is, uh, this with, uh, Spring Boot applications, you can provide certain properties as defaults, but again, we don't want to stick our properties, we don't want to embed our properties in our application. So these are just the defaults. You can also use environment variables or pass in on the, uh, the command line what you want to provide. Again, for a demo, expedience kind of rules the day. Uh, I'm also going to point to the get URI. Uh, you can use GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, uh, I'm going to use a local repo. You can do that as well on your local file system or your local network. Uh, for developers, you'd probably use your local file system just as I'm doing here. And the only other thing that we need to do to get this to act as a config server is to let it know that we want it to act as a config server. 
So while that's starting up, uh, let me go here and let me kind of zoom in on this a little bit, uh, a little higher. Okay, this gives you a little bit of an idea of what, uh, what kind of configuration you have behind the scenes for your config server. Uh, you will typically have an application.properties, or you can also use YAML, uh, but your application properties consist of properties that are served up to all microservices that contact the config service and request properties. You can also designate based on platform or uh, profile, like you see the application cloud properties up there. And then if you designate by name a particular service name, like Eureka service or Edge service, you'll get those properties as well as the general application properties for your application, for your service as it's identified. Obviously, the, the preference is extended to the ones that match specifically to that service. So those take preference over your general application properties. But that's kind of what we're, uh, we're looking at in terms of behind the scenes for the config server. So we're up and running on 8088. So let's go take a look at that. And for instance, I will pull up the application master, which just shows you the general properties that are available for all, uh, all services that identify or all, that communicate, uh, contact the config server. So if we take another look at, nice, there we go. For instance, our edge service, uh, when, our, when a microservice identifies itself as an edge service, it will get both the properties here for all applications, but then also the more specific properties for the edge service. So that, in a nutshell, is a config service. So we have that configured now. The next thing that we need to do is go back and create our service registry uh, for microservice discovery. Now, anyone here with a uh, quaint concept called a phone book? Anyone here old enough to have used a phone book? Oh, come on, there are at least a couple of you who've used a phone book. All right. I mean, anymore, we just say, hey, Siri, call Bob. But, uh, you know, in the old days, if you were in Amsterdam and you had a friend in Amsterdam, you would flip through this massive tome and find their name, first by last name, then first, and then you'd have a phone number and you'd key it into the, this device, usually hanging on a wall or sitting on a desk, and then you would call them. That's effectively what a service registry allows your microservices to do. It keeps track of your services as well as the instances of said services and allows you to basically connect the dots. This does not introduce a bottleneck because unlike things like an enterprise service bus, you're not funneling all communication through it. It's just serving as a lookup. And all that information is cached. So even if it goes offline briefly, and typically you do cluster these things, but even if you didn't, if it goes offline, your microservice, once it's established that initial connection, it has that information cached until Eureka comes back up and reconnects. So uh, we don't want to identify it as a config server, but what we do want to do is uh, identify it as a config client so it can contact our configuration service and get the information it needs for its properties. But we also want to uh, be sure it can identify, provide our dependencies for a Eureka server. So we'll generate that project. Same thing, we generate the, uh, basically the empty shell project, download it, extract it, open it. And then we'll, we'll do things just a little bit differently here. Uh, let's see here. Because I'm not used to using my separate uh, Ergo keyboard at home, so anytime I go onto the laptop, it's like rediscovering my keyboard all over again. Um, when you're dealing with a Spring Cloud application, you want to, uh, well, let me back up. With your typical Spring Boot applications, you have the application initial initialization. So the application context is created when the application initializes itself. But what we want to do is a Spring Cloud application because we want to contact our config service and get our configuration from it prior to application initialization, we need to get that kind of in a bootstrap type of mode ahead of the game. So before our application context is established, we need to reach out and get those configuration properties. So we want it in bootstrap. Rather than an application properties file, typically then what we do for a Spring Cloud app is create a bootstrap.properties. So I'm just going to, uh, and there are several ways you can do this as well. Um, let's see, and for some reason my key command isn't working, so I will just do this. 
change it to bootstrap properties. Works the same, you can have both, but really no reason to. So the first thing that we want to do is identify this microservice as our Eureka service, which again allows it to pull back the Eureka service properties from the config server. The other thing that we want to do is provide the URI for our config service. In this case, we have it running at localhost 8888. And then the other thing that we need to do is, again, identify this as a Eureka server in this case. If you notice, I'm doing very little coding at this point. The, the one thing that, uh, as you see over time, Java is becoming more and more annotation driven. Spring is very annotation driven. Spring Boot is very annotation driven. I set a few parameters. I, uh, add a couple of annotations typically, and that allows uh, Spring Boot, when it initializes, to uh, create the, the beans that will support this particular use case. So it allows you to provide a lot of information about a particular application without having to do a lot of manual coding. Now, we will do some coding here in a little bit, but anything that you can do to eliminate a lot of time spent on undifferentiated heavy lifting is a good thing, because that allows you to focus on your business logic that actually makes a difference for your business. So we'll go ahead and run that. Notice it's very quick to come up. One of the things that it pulls from our config service is the port number. So as long as we verify that, yep, it is running on port 8761, we know it's hitting the uh, config service. So let's go over and check out Eureka. Now, the Eureka dashboard gives us you know, several pieces of inf information here, but kind of the key bit of information is this part. The instances are currently registered with Eureka. Right now, there are none. We haven't created any microservices and registered them yet, but that will change. So let's do that. I'm going to create a quote service because I like quotes. Um, anyone here a quote geek? Movie quotes, historic quotes, pithy quotes of any kind? Okay, good. All right, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> um, the rest of you I know like quotes. I mean, if you have a quote of the day app on your phone, come on. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm going to create a quote uh, backing service that allows our edge service to communicate with it and pull back a quote of the day, ultimately. So the things that we need for that, we also need it to be a config client. Uh, we'll be creating a web API for it. We want it to be a discovery client so it can contact our Eureka service and register itself as well as look up other services in it. Uh, we'll also, since we're going to be storing and retrieving quotes, we'll want to have some mechanism for doing that. And since, as a colleague of mine likes to say, I make poor life choices, I'll use JPA. Uh, and with that gives us our access to a lot of different relational databases. You don't have to use relational, you can use Mongo or Couchbase or if you want to graph database Neo4j or anything like that. But again, I make poor life choices, so I'll use JPA and H2. H2 is an in-memory database, again, works really well for our case uh, here today, but you can use MySQL or, or Postgres or, God forbid, one of the heavier databases out there that you pay a lot of money for. So anyway, uh, with that said, we also want to incorporate REST repositories. Spring Data is a really cool project that, that allows you to expose your data repositories as REST endpoints. So we'll pull that in. For the price of a dependency, it gives you a lot of capability. Uh, I'm going to include Hate OAS. I know some people pronounce that differently. Those people are wrong. Uh, I have worked with a product called OAS in the past. I can assure you that Hate OAS is the proper pronunciation of that. Um, but, that segue aside, also include the HAL browser. Uh, Hate OAS, by the way, is hypermedia is the engine of application state. It's a really fancy way of, holy cow, we're close on time. Okay, it's a really fancy way of saying that it allows you to build navigation into your data that's returning to your application so you're not locked in and coding it. Uh, the best example I can think of off the top of my head is uh, Amazon. When you put five items in your cart, you can't return one for a refund. You haven't bought them yet. So it allows your application to dynamically respond to the circumstances at that time. Uh, that 
link simply would not be there at that point. Once you've bought the product, then you would have the option based on a, a hypermedia uh, set of links to return that item for a refund. The HAL browser is a really cool way to exercise your REST endpoints without having to develop your full application. Uh, so we'll include that uh, just for grins. And let's see, is there anything else that we really need? Uh, we'll just stop there for now. Uh, we're not going to have time to, to get into a few things, but I always tell people, you know, we've got 40 minutes roughly here today. That's not enough time to even cover all the topics, even at a very high level, very well. But what I try to do is throw out enough things that we can get a good conversation going. So please, 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 if you're interested, if you want to talk about something, if I glossed over something way too quickly and left out a key point, hit me up later. You know, ping me on Twitter, email me, whatever, that's great. Because uh, my goal is just to kind of foster conversation and thought at this point. Uh, get the, the good stuff really comes later. So save this down. Um, I'm just kind of going through in my mind what I can leave out and still um, at time. Um, I'll try to keep this fairly, um, fairly quick and clean, as well as trying to speed things up a little bit. If I go too fast, uh, because you know, even though I'm not drinking coffee right now, if I wind up going too fast, tell me to slow down. <laughs> so anyway, again, similar drill. We're going to rename our application properties to bootstrap.properties so we can uh, pull in our config service uh, properties. Uh, again, we'll provide our name. This is our quote service. And our configury, which is HTTP localhost 8888. And then we will go to our application. Again, we're going to tell this uh, that we want uh, to register with our Eureka server. So that's pretty much it. That at least gets us our basic level of functionality. So we have a service that will register with Eureka, but it does nothing else at this point. Remember, I added dependencies for JPA and H2. So let's go ahead and create a, an entity. This is a JPA entity. It's not a Spring unique um, annotation. It's a Java annotation. So it's a standard Java uh, persistence API annotation. We will uh, create a class, call it quote, and I am really going to zip through this. We'll define a few fields uh, for our quote text and our quote source, because every quote needs a source, right? We will create a no parameter constructor for JPA and JSON. And then we'll also create another constructor, somewhat more useful. And then we'll do some getters. And then maybe we'll just throw in a two string. OK, good enough. The one thing that I didn't do so far is with JPA entities, you have to tell it effectively what, designate what the ID field is. We're going to designate that as well as uh, letting our data repository know how to deal with the ID value. So we're going to tell it to generate the value. So again, we've gotten a little bit further. We've defined a JPA entity, but we have nothing to, uh, to do with it at this point. So let's fix that. Uh, we have an annotation called repository rest resource, which ties together and does a lot of uh, things kind of automatically for us. Again, some of the undifferentiated heavy lifting. It ties our data repository together with our rest endpoints. So we are going to define an interface. I'll call it the quote repository. And we'll extend CRUD repository, which is, again, a spring data construct. We will designate the entity type as quote. Oops. The ID type as long. And just by doing this, it, it makes that connection between our data repository and our REST endpoints. Doesn't give us a lot. I'm going to shortcut a little bit of stuff here so this isn't quite as clear as when I break out of each step. Uh, please forgive me, but I know we're really short on time and I don't want to run you guys too late for coffee and break and then your next one and then, of course, lunch. Um, this gets us a lot of capabilities kind of baked right in. So this will provide our, our aggregate endpoints, if you will. We've defined a quote entity. This will create for us uh, an endpoint of quotes. And then we, so what that allows us to do out of the box is get to our collection of quotes as well as get to a specific quote by, uh, by number. Uh, we're 
at this point going to also provide a query. Uh, we can define certain queries that allow us to do what we want. So we can add in additional capability. It gives us that opinionated start, and then we can add and extend from there. So I'm going to select Q from quote Q, order by rand, and define a method which returns a list of quotes. Uh, get quotes random order. So this will return our quotes in a random order. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to do really quickly is define a rest, oops, rest controller. Uh, getting way ahead of myself, thinking about three steps down the road here. And define a quote controller, provide a, an endpoint then that we can Create that will allow us to retrieve that random quote. So it's kind of our quote of the day, if you will. So, um, what? and we will again very quickly. Bring that in, and I just realized that I had uh, omitted something else here. So this, at this point, you see that it, it lets us, allows us to access our method that we've defined. We're going to pull back our quotes in random order, and we're going to simply get the first one. Now, there's one thing that we don't have at this point. We have all the mechanisms in place, but we don't have any quotes. <laughs> so I'm going to create the world's worst quotes in the world's shortest amount of time uh, by uh, creating a bean and loading it in a bean container. So I will, as a shortcut, do a command line runner. And I'm going to, again, auto wire into that our quote repository. Auto wire is just another way of saying inject, so we're going to inject our quote repository in here. And since this is a single abstract method, uh, we're going to write our arguments here. And what I'll do at this point is do a save, create a new quote, uh, quote one. Again, don't judge me on the quality of my quotes. If I had more time, they'd be much, much better than this. Okay, so again, shortcutting a few things. Okay, so we have three quotes, three very crude quotes. At this point, we'll go ahead and run this, and we'll pull it up and make sure that everything works and that I haven't omitted something silly. And the first thing I want to show you is the HAL browser. Again, this allows you to exercise your, your REST endpoints. You can see here we have a quotes endpoint. I can click on the get. It shows over here our nice hot AOS, hate OAS, however you want to pronounce it, uh, JSON structure, uh, navigable links. You can go in here and select each one. You can, um, you can do gets, you can do non-gets. So it allows you to exercise that uh, quite nicely. Again, as a developer, it's a nice extra feature. I'm going to skip past that at this point and just go directly to an endpoint. And of course, you see the quotes returned. Uh, that's kind of baked in functionality. But if you remember, we created a random endpoint. And this brings back a random quote. OK, really quickly, I'm going to create, the again, the world's fastest edge service. <laughs> So we go back to the Spring Initializer. We'll go ahead and create an edge service. We still want it to have a config client. We want a web interface. We want it to register with Eureka. We don't care about JPA or the database behind it. We don't necessarily care about REST, API, uh, uh, REST repositories. I'll omit these just for, for expedience. Uh, we're probably not going to have a lot of time to do or any time to do Hystrix. But just in case, I'll go ahead and put it in there. Edge service, save, 
open, open, okay. Okay, that's not bad. So we'll go in again and we will rename our application properties to bootstrap.properties and then we'll open it and provide a couple things. Again, this will be our edge service and point it to our configury. And again, we will tell it it's a discovery client. Now, really meet Bali here. Uh, we're going to leave this We're gonna leave this as it is, I guess, because we are pretty short on time, but I'll go ahead and run this and give you at least a, a taste of the intelligent routing uh, capabilities that are provided again with Zool. Uh, more time would, would show more stuff, but uh, this should give us a nice little uh, hint, a nice little peek. Uh, if we just go here, of course, we have nothing on the, uh, the basic page, but, and oh, we have nothing there either. Oh, that's because I put the wrong annotation. Uh, it doesn't protect you from yourself, folks. Uh, you still have to get the right, uh, right stuff in there. Okay, let's try that again. Because you have to let it know that it's a Zool proxy. Zool proxy allows you to use Zool routes, define Zool routes. Again, Zool is your intelligent router. I don't know if anyone's up on their Hittite um, um, mythology or their Ghostbusters mythology, but uh, Zool is the gatekeeper to the underworld. So we're going to be uh, talking to our gatekeeper here. Okay, much, much better. Uh, in my normal demonstration, I actually, oh, wow, okay. We're actually over time, so I'll really make this quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me pull this up and give you at least a peek at this. Okay. Zool allows you to define routes. In this case, what you saw is uh, I've defined a route for the quote service. This, this actually ties in a couple of three really neat things. I'll, I'll talk you through a couple of them and then we'll, we'll just call it a day. Uh, any URL that goes to this edge service with a slash QS and anything after it will then go to our quote service because it does a Eureka lookup. Eureka tells it the quote service is running in this place or that place. So it'll go ahead and pass that through. And this is what you see here, QS slash quotes. So it passes that through to our back end quote service and it returns that, uh, the results of that. You can also, as a result, hit any endpoint that's defined on the back end. Now, this is what's typically called a microproxy. It doesn't provide any kind of translation. Well, not really. Uh, it does a straight translation, but it's certainly not hiding any back-end service URLs. Um, maybe that's enough for your needs. Maybe it isn't. Maybe you need uh, to mask that. Maybe you have manipulation that has to happen, marshalling of, of various results, coarsening of the uh, calls so that you can use your spotty mobile network versus your very secure and, and connected um, uh, Ethernet-connected desktop. But those options are up to you. Zool allows you to do a lot of that without having to, to code a lot of that. You can also uh, create your local or uh, public API endpoints. I have one defined here that I normally uh, develop when there's uh, sufficient time that you can forward to a local endpoint. And then even from there, you can still go ahead and, and do your network lookups in, in um, uh, Eureka. You also, by default, with Azul proxy, get Hystrix, which is your circuit breaker, so that if something goes down, it can default to another method and allow you to gracefully degrade. In Netflix, when you have your you know, recommendations for youth, movies you might like, if that service goes offline, it doesn't just show a big black box across the middle of your screen. It shows movies popular in your area, movies popular this week. It gracefully degrades. It still provides some meaningful result without giving you the full capability of that service that now is, is missing. So uh, anyway, um, that's a very abbreviated uh, version of things. So let me... Go back to this, kick this back on, and wrap this up. Okay, so helpful links. Uh, of course, let's... Uh,
Let's go back to those. If anyone wants to get a uh, shot of those, by all means, spring.io guides. We have a, a ton of getting started guides out there, probably more information than you would ever want. Uh, but that gives you a really swift introduction uh, into the world of microservices using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. Uh, obviously, Spring Boot, Spring Cloud uh, repos. All Spring products, all, all Pivotal products are open source. You can go out and download the bits yourself. Please do. Uh, we take pull requests. You know, we're always happy to, to have people find issues or find things that we can be doing better and help us out with that. Uh, so by all means, again, open source is the present and the future. We, we live that, we breathe that. Uh, my repo's out there. Everything that I put out here, even more complete examples, uh, are in my repo and more as, as time goes on as well. So in summary, uh, microservices can be hard, but they don't have to be. Oh, yeah, I just keep uh, stutter typing, I guess, here. Um, so we'll hit that again. They don't have to be. Uh, there are some real giants out there who have done a lot of work to make life a lot easier for all of us, so by all means, leverage their work. Netflix does it, so can you. So uh, thank you for attending, and if you have any questions or anything, I'm sorry we're out of time, but please do reach out to me. I do respond to email, tweets, whatever, so um, looking forward to all of us learning some more down the road. So good? Was it good? Anything? Okay. <laughs>